the Melville Castle turned Freiheit had already made many long, hard voyages when she was brought to bring soldiers to the Batavian Republic's colonies on the Cape and Jakarta. It was soon found that she had passed inspection by putting copper and paint over rot, however, and what should have been a long voyage only lasted a couple of days with a horrible cost of life. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the poor repair of Vryheid? Here we are. Enjoy! The British East India Company ship, the Melville Castle, had completed seven voyages for the company between the years 1786 and 1799. While that was a normal quantity of voyages, and some of their ships completed even more, it was becoming clear to the company that the life of the Melville Castle had run its course. With this thought in mind, it was announced that the Melville Castle was up for sale. At 990 tons, the Melville Castle was an attractive merchant ship on paper. But the merchants who came out and looked at her all walked away shaking their heads. It was clear to all of them that she had not been well maintained, and many of them expressed the opinion that she should have just been broken up, not sold. An agent of a Dutch merchant group was among those who inspected the ship, and for reasons beyond anyone's understanding, he apparently saw potential in the worn-out vessel. A later writer from Britain would express some amazement that someone who was also from a seagoing nation could have decided to buy the Melville Castle. But the transaction was complete, and the Dutch merchants took possession of their new ship. The Dutch merchants were not buying the Melville Castle, quickly renamed the Vrijheid, for their own use alone. The Batavian Republic was looking for a large ship that would transport soldiers to the Cape of Good Hope and Jakarta, and their agreement with the merchants was that they would transport the soldiers out, and that on the return voyage, the merchants would be able to transport goods. The merchants who had purchased the Vrijheid did acknowledge that they would first need to do some work on the aging vessel. Once the Vrijheid reached Amsterdam, they set to work. <laughs> The extent of these repairs were somewhat questionable when bringing to mind the many hard voyages that she had undertaken as the Melville Castle, and her age. They did do some work on her upper works, and painted her up so that she looked better. They also put new copper sheathing on her hull, but this simply hid the fact that all of her timbers were rotten. Nonetheless, they called her good, and a government surveyor who was brought on board agreed with them. She would be the ship that would transport the soldiers for the Batavian Republic. The men of the 2nd Marine Battalion, a mixed group of French, Dutch, and German soldiers who had been stationed in Rotterdam, were ordered to march to Amsterdam. Having inspected the men, the officers who were to be in command of the expedition selected 320 of the best soldiers out of the nearly 1,000 men in the battalion. The men they selected were far from random. They were the soldiers who had proven themselves previously during the Battle of Bergen in 1799. Coming along on the expedition was also an admiral, who was going to be a passenger on this voyage, and military officers of both the Batavian and French armies to command the troops. On the 20th of September, 1802, the soldiers were ordered on board of the Vrijheid, but the officers and the admiral spent one last night ashore at a dinner hosted by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. On the morning of the 21st, they also went on board the Vrijheid, accompanied by wives, children, and servants. As soon as the officers were on board, the Vrijheid got underway. They could expect a long voyage ahead of them. The next morning, they found that what had been a favorable breeze on the 21st had begun to turn into a gale on the morning of the 22nd, and Captain Sherman ordered the crew to strike the topgallant yards, which offered some temporary relief. Still, many of the people on board were on edge. 
One of the crew later reported that he was close friends with the captain steward, who told him that if the gale increased, all hands would be lost because the ship could not weather it. This was a dangerous statement to make. It could have seen the steward punished for alarming the crew, but the fact that the Vreiheit was in danger seemed to be an open secret. When the officers did their best to remain calm, and project the idea that nothing was wrong, their wives had no such obligation since they were not under military discipline. Many of the women on board began to beg their husbands to allow them to be put on shore, though it is unlikely a small boat would have survived the voyage in the gale conditions. Even Captain Sherman's wife, who had their three-month-old baby to worry about, began to plead with her husband to do something to ensure their protection. As the 22nd wore on, the storm showed no sign of letting up. Indeed, its intensity only increased until around three in the afternoon, when the mainmast gave out, sweeping several of the crew into the sea with it and injuring five other crew members. With this, the mood on the ship shifted noticeably. The admiral, captain, and other officers were no longer trying to hide their anxiety, and it became clear that this was a fight for their lives. They could see the coast of Kent clearly. They were even able to make out details of the landscape, but they may as well have been in the middle of the ocean for all the help that it would bring. With the waves as high as they were, and winds as strong as they were blowing, the people on the ship could not reach the shore, and people on the shore could not reach the ship. Captain Sherman had a distress flag flown, but it was acknowledged that they were going to have to bring the ship into a safer station. After a long day of fighting the storm, the Vryheide finally found anchor near the entrance of Hythe Bay. It seemed as though the storm had calmed some, and it was dark, so it was decided that it was wiser to not attempt entering the bay. Everyone began to relax on board, and the crew was ordered extra rations and allowed to rest after their difficult day. But this peace was not to last. The calmer weather also brought them guests, in answer to their still-flying flag of distress. First came a pilot boat from Dover, and advised them to turn to Deal of Hythe for shelter, telling them if they continued in the state they were in, they would not make it. Captain Sherman felt that the storm had already mostly blown its course, though, and he did not want to pay the pilot fee or the harbor fee that would be required if they entered Deal or Hythe. Soon after the pilot left, the Commodore of Deal sent two boats, but when the men on the boats tried to board the stricken vessel, Captain Sherman attempted to have his ship evade them. One of the boats passed by the ship's stern and shouted up that since they had lost their mainmast, they should put into port immediately. Captain Sherman refused to reply to this, and soon the renewed storm separated the Vreiheid from the two boats. Captain Sherman would soon have reason to regret his choice to not find shelter or accept aid. The men who had went below quickly returned. Now, with the news of a new disaster, the ship had sprung a leak. The already exhausted crew was ordered to go to the pumps. While the crew was occupied on the pumps, the strength of the storm also resumed, and the ship was now truly in a fight for its life. The distress flag was still flying from the mast, but added to this was now a gun firing to signal distress as well but now the weather was too bad for anyone to come to their aid from the shore. At six o'clock on the 23rd, the Vreiheid broke free from her bower anchor and began to drift. Repeatedly, Captain Sherman tried to bring the ship about and try to find shelter, but the force of the storm rendered such efforts meaningless, and she eventually was brought to Dimchurch Wall. Dimchurch Sea Wall, three miles from Hythe, was built of piles and cross pieces of timber, and supported with wooden jetties. The Vreihai did not make it past the first of these jetties. Once the Vreihai had struck once, she continued to drive upon the piles, and the wind was growing stronger yet. Captain Sherman ordered that the mizzenmast be cut away, but this seemed to do nothing to alleviate their troubles. 
desperate to lessen the load of the ship, the captain ordered all of the water casks be stove in, while everyone else who was available needed to work the pumps. Almost all of the ballast on board was also thrown overboard, but this also did little to alleviate their danger. The officers on board were no longer able to hold back and began to complain to Captain Sherman about his choice to not enter a harbor, and he seemed to be blaming himself as well. But it was too late for such regrets. The Admiral, who was only a passenger on this voyage, voiced the suggestion that they should jettison the sheet anchor, which was done in the hopes that they would be able to bring the ship away from the Dunchurch Wall. The entire time that they had been working the pumps and throwing ballast overboard, the ship was still beating on the piles, while the sea had begun to flood the ship. The pumps were now useless. They had filled with sand. Almost as soon as the pumps stopped working, the ship's foremast went, taking twelve sailors with it. The loss of the foremast seemed to have a direct impact on the mood of those on the ship, and everyone seemed to lose all hope that might have been left. It was soon discovered as a final blow that the rudder had broken loose, and the tiller was now tearing up the gun deck, causing the water to rush into the ship even faster. It was now hard to even hear the firing of the distress gun over the sound of the waves that were roaring over the ship. Though the morning was dark, the people on board the ship were able to see people standing on the seawall, but with the storm as bad as it was, there was no chance of help. An extremely violent wave hit the ship and smashed her into the piles even harder than before. At 25 minutes past 8 in the morning, the ship split apart from the blow her back broken. About 170 people were thrown into the water instantly. None of these people would reach the shore. The quarterdeck remained intact for the time being, and the admiral now requested that the sailors launch the jolly boat that was still hanging from the stern, so that himself and some of the female passengers could attempt to make landfall. The admiral, the army colonel, and eight of the women on board got on the boat and headed towards the shore. Captain Sherman's wife refused to join them, choosing to remain at her husband's side. Those on board watched as the jolly boat, only a couple of minutes later, were buried beneath the waves of the storm, and none of them rose to surface again. Those on the quarterdeck did not have long to think about this tragedy, however. The quarterdeck was now also breaking up, and all of them decided to try to find their own ways to shore. The crew assisted Captain Sherman, his wife, and their child, and cut free the ship's hen coop. The three were tied to it, and the coop was lowered over the side. Wishing the family the best, the crew watched on deck with hope, but the coop was soon smashed by a piece of the wreck, carried with great force by a wave, and the captain and his family were not seen again either. The crew was not done trying to preserve lives. A military lieutenant, his wife, his sister, and two female servants that had been part of the admiral's family were still on board, and the crew decided to try to save them. One of the ship's hatches had broken free, and the crew chose to use this as a raft, tying each of the women to it, while the lieutenant, who was a good swimmer, took a rope from the raft around his waist, with the intention of pulling the raft to shore. This time, the wind caught the raft and flipped it, sinking it too with everyone on board. Many of the remaining people on board, estimated about 105 people, had sought refuge in the bowsprit and rigging, and when this tore free from the wreck, it at first looked as though this would at least reach the shore and safety, but instead, it was dashed into the seawall. All around the wreck was now bodies and wreckage, and not a single person had reached the shore. About 45 people remained on pieces of the ship that remained. Two of the crew who had survived a previous shipwreck tied themselves to a hog trough, and the rest of the crew lowered them into the sea. These two would be the first to reach the shore, though they had a close call with a large piece of the wreck and they waved their hats to the people still on board to signal to them to follow. This success heartened those on board, who numbered 33, came together to build a raft, which they each tied themselves to. Almost as soon as this raft departed the wreck, another large wave hit the Vryhide, 
and with this she completely disintegrated. With this came a new danger. While pieces of the wreck had been a danger before, now the sea was entirely awash with them. Eighteen of the thirty-three ran afoul of a large piece of the wreckage and were swept away. Even those who managed to remain on the raft were in very rough condition when they reached the shore. One of the eighteen almost did not make it either, but a Mr. Kemp, a local, seeing the danger, rushed into the water, endangering his own life, and pulled him out of the ocean. Though the 18 people who had survived out of a ship company that had totaled 472 were all in poor health after their ordeal, they were soon being nursed back to health. The final tally of those who had made the shore was 8 of the soldiers and 10 of the sailors. Those who had been lost included 312 soldiers, 42 officers, 22 women, 20 passengers, 7 children, and 51 seamen. The sailors and soldiers who did survive wondered at the kindness they received at the hands of the locals. The Treaty of Amiens had only been signed in March, and before that they would have been enemies with the same people who were now taking the utmost care of them. Not only were they clothed, fed, and housed for ten days until they could be returned to Rotterdam, but they were also given money to address any wants they had and for their transport. Any of the bodies that were washed ashore were interred with full honors and respect, including that of the captain of the Marines, who was buried with full military honors. Captain Sherman, his wife, and their child washed to shore together, and so they were buried as well. Some salvage by the locals was undertaken as items washed on shore, but when a chest of gold was found, to the surprise of those of the Batavian Republic, it was returned to the family of the colonel to whom it had belonged, rather than kept by those who found it. With a final note of bitterness, one of the surviving members of the crew noted that a small merchantman for Tessel had been caught in the same storm, having sailed the same day from Tessel that they had. She, however, had taken a pilot from Margate with her and had been brought into port and had not lost a single person in the same storm that had destroyed the fragile Vrijheid. For more information, please see Tales of Shipwrecks and Other Disasters at Sea by Thomas Bingley or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.